Here and now, here we be. And the uh, genocide continues in spite of uh, Biden's uh, recriminations, in spite of Biden providing some words, trying to indicate that he still has a sanity and said something about Israel being over the top. This is what he said about Hamas uh, a week ago. Okay, so now he's caught between two over the tops. What's he going to do? I have some quotation of his, in which he appears to appear to be a, a nice liberal. But um, now there's uh, some sort of indication that the um, military aid to uh, the Zionist state is going to be conditional upon its respect of international law. So this is a provision that was always present, you know, but was never applied. So now supposedly, you know, it's going to be applied. And uh, so, but we'll see what's happening, you know, like when it, when it happens. But uh, so far it hasn't happened. So what else is there to be done? I see that there's uh, another uh, revolution breaking out in Senegal. You sent that uh, a video. This yes. is very encouraging, you know. I can uh, share screen it here and uh, and show it to everyone as well. That sounds great. Okay, let's try this. Oh, I think that's it there. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Maki, uh, I think, is the uh, past prime minister who lost miserably in the election. Well, who would have lost miserably in the election if the election had actually taken place. But because the polls indicated that his party was like uh, a third, you know, party in the list uh, of potential voters, you know, he decided that uh, people wouldn't vote. So there they are. Uh, their language is well off. Uh, that's what they're chanting in. I used to be married, you know, with a Senegalese Muslim woman once here in Canada a long time ago. It's a friendship marriage. Uh, I think she's in Chicago now. She has a hair braiding shop or two. Anyway, yeah, Senegal's, you know, like a big, big body of people that can really sort of, you know, put things over the edge, you know, as far as Africa is concerned. Yeah, and uh, Mali and uh, Burkina Faso have quit the ECOWAS um, organization. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Yeah. So the issue, I mean, I wanted to make sure people could see what's occurring around the world because when I received these these clips from um, the internet, the African International Socialist um, um, thread, which is a, a membership only international a group of, of Africans who have, who want a socialist and a more humanitarian Africa. I want to make sure people can see it because mm -hmm. there's a lot happening on the continent. And for one reason or another, usually un underdevelopment, intentional underdevelopment, and lack of access to the internet or how to use the internet correctly. People don't hear about it. Mm. So that's why I want to share these videos. I want to thank you for sharing them to people mm. who are watching. I just also want to welcome everybody to the program. I hope that you all will please like and subscribe to this um, this particular YouTube program and share with others. 
Um, you know, to me, the situation with Biden is, uh, I had to kind of take a turn on Biden a couple of days ago. Biden had a had some kind of, some kind of a legal case in which he was deemed to have uh, hmm. dementia. Now, I am against all of the social pressure to cancel somebody because of age. In the United States, I don't know about in Europe. I don't. I don't think it's the case in Africa or in Asia. But in the United States, the cancel culture around age is quite strong because the, the civilization the United States has created, while it promotes or allows people of who are a who are aging to hold office. When they reach a certain age, the cancel culture says that they're too old, quote unquote, and they can't do it. And I oppose that view. Yeah. It's like a vicious but, circle, you know, because if old people are too old to work, if they don't work, then they degenerate. You know, like you have to work to, yeah, yeah, it's, you it's, know, to keep your mind it's, active, it's, so to keep I, it alive. It's, it's, you know, yeah. the anti, anti-ageism is a progressive movement, in my opinion. Because yeah. we want people to age. Yeah. We want people to stay alive if they can't be alive and be, and use their wisdom and use their ability to learn from other people and be members of society. I think that is a progressive idea. Yeah, I think it's true. You know, like the the older the, the longer you've lived, you know, the more experience you've had, you know, the the smarter you're going to be, basically, you know, like, you know, even a young person, you know, can appreciate that, you know, because if they think about what they were like a year before, they realize, you know, that over the course of a year, you know, they've certainly advanced. And if you multiply that by the number of years that you've lived, you know, like, you've got another story happening here, you know, so, you know, have a listen here. Yeah. The issue with Biden, though, if he has dementia, then I think we have to, I think it is right to consider for him to consider, I'm see, I'm taking away all the presidential stuff. Him being him being an imperialist stooge, him being a servant of the ruling class, him being a promoter of racism, promoter of, of Israeli uh, Israeli military assault and and uh, murders. Of, as a human being, he needs he needs to check it because if you if you're unable to do what you need to do to do the job, especially be, especially being president. Then he may be something else to consider. That's all. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Because yeah. If, if 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 say you have a job, that's something that you're doing. Uh, I and, think this and, came out about you know this discussion was you know like it was ignited you know like because he didn't know how to refer to Hamas you know because he sort of stumbled over the the name you know they was going to call them you know he called them first you know the opposition because he didn't know if if, if he called them Hamas that this was a diplomatic recognition of Hamas as the government of Palestine you know like he gets all confused you know because he doesn't know what he's doing you know in the first place you know all he knows about is you know being a Christian Zionist and that's about it so you know when it comes to Hamas. <laughs> You know, like, what does he say? You know, like, he doesn't know. And he got caught right in the middle of a live, you know, broadcast, you know, so that it was more of a case like that, you know, it was more a case of ignorance than it was, you know, of a loss of memory of, you know, what Hamas was called, because everybody calls Hamas Hamas, you know, but they should call it, you know, Palestine. <laughs> but, but, no, but, but what, what, what I'm referring to, though, uh, Abraham, there, there's a law, there's a, there's a, there was a criminal case against him, some kind of case against him regarding him possessing Oh See, yeah, uh, the documents that he wasn't supposed to have, right, like uh, Trump was uh, charged with. Yeah, right, and, and but he was excused because of his supposed loss of memory. That's a right. good excuse, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's to get him that's off the that's hook. All, that's you know? all I'm saying. But yeah. um, 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 this week for me it was a very difficult week because I ran across some information from the geopolitical report regarding the U.S. and Syria. Now, I want all the people who are listening to us, our viewers and our listeners, to remember, it doesn't make a difference where the U.S. bases are. 
The U.S. bases are a projection of U.S. empire and imperialism and domination. That's why they're there. Now, there was a supposed drone attack, supposed, supposed drone attack on the U.S. base. One day it was in Syria. Next day it was in Jordan. It doesn't make a difference if, if it was in Jordan or Syria. But if, but, if, but if it was in Syria, we must remember, the U.S. occupies Syria against the permission of the government there. Hmm. Nobody can say we cannot justify U.S. presence in a country when they ask you to leave or you, if you just occupy it and say, blank you, we're here. Hmm. And in Syria, that's what's going on. Now, there was a um, gray zone report, gray zone pro program a few days ago where a civilian member of the Pentagon staff, whose name I don't recall at this moment, was discussing why the U.S. is in Syria. It's all about what, what they call leverage, have leverage over the country, have leverage over reconstruction, et cetera. Mm -hmm. what, what, what appalled me over all the things that 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 they, that U.S. does that appalls me. Was well, this person said that the U.S. Army owns one third of Syria? How can the U.S. Army own anything besides its 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 uh, gear, its base? I mean, it's, the U.S. Army doesn't own own a country, but this American imperialist stooge, this this uh, scumbag of a person had the gall and the boldness to just make such a statement. The U.S. owns one third of Syria. <laughs> that should show our viewers and listeners the mentality of those who occupy positions of power within the state. <laughs> they carry out these acts with the belief that not only are they justified, but they are morally um is defensible more defensible yeah. correct <laughs> it's, it's not defensible to say you own the land of mm. another country mm. the u.s does not own nothing in syria yeah. and so if you think about why we are so vociferous and so militant in our opposition to what the empire wants to do here is an example right here mm. they dare to say we own a third we own a third of your country we occupied mm -hmm. it illegally, and then they take the oil revenues, which I still don't get how that's done, but I'm gonna figure it out one day. The oil, the oil fields and the wheat fields, and take mm -hmm. the at least take the oil and use it to fund a Syrian group that the U.S. likes. Mm -hmm. Incredible. Mm -hmm. That's all I want to say about it. It's just I want our, yeah. I want our viewers and listeners to consider that. In that case, in Syria. Um, you know, Syria has asked the U.S. military to leave, and Iraq has voted, you know, to to force the U.S. military to leave, and it's supposed to be implemented soon. But in Syria, you know, what initially turned me off Assad, you know, is that he invited the U.S. in in the first place to fight ISIS, and, he, and then he invited Russia in, and, and then Turkey came in without being invited, and then you know he changed his mind about the U.S., you know, which is nice, but you know that's what initially sort of you know made me very wary of Assad. But he seems to be taking a, a turn, you know, towards uh, the third world block now. So, oh boy. So perhaps, you know, he can get the uh, U.S. military out of there. Uh, you know, um, uh, Comrade Ahmed, you know, he uh, made a breakthrough into the Canadian media, got interviewed. And I have him on a share screen, you know, I can show it to you, you know, it's magnificent. And he is really excellent in English now. He really knows how to express, you know, like his feelings as a Palestinians in a way, you know, that other people can understand. It's really magnificent. Uh, if uh, I'll take a moment, you know, to show this to you. Uh, here it is. Ah, yes. <clears throat> this is Ahmad. And this is the Maple online uh, Mag um, newspaper or magazine, newspaper, and Palestinians in Canada say their voices in history are being erased. Uh huh. 
And uh, read it, but some of the uh, quotations, you know, that struck me as being uh, very pertinent and uh, exceptional is how he was tortured. He told me about this when I first met him in 1981 in Toronto when he helped me to hold a, a banner of uh, Jewish opposition to Zionism when we first met at a demonstration there in front of the uh, 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 Zionist uh, consulate. He was hung by his hands to the wall, slapped in the face, punched in the abdomen, kicked in the legs, spat on and cursed. Are you with them? An Israeli Shabak officer asked him, are you with them? No, the Palestinian detainee said, that's Ahmed. Exhausted and looking at the whip resting on the wall, knowing what it was only a matter of time before it would be used on him. This was the daily routine for Ahmed Abu Ali during his months in Israeli detention in 1979. He was 18 years old. And, uh, you know, the way they sort of, you know, this is, you know, normal treatment of prisoners. They do, you know, a whole torture trip, the purpose of which is to uh, find out if somebody is a member of a particular Palestinian resistance group, and if so, to force them, you know, to uh, inform on that group. And then uh, if they're compliant enough, then they are turned into uh, an agent and sent back and freed. Uh, otherwise, they'd spend, you know, 10 years in prison, even though they weren't a member of a group. <laughs> You know, just to, because they wouldn't confess to something. So, you know, they just do these dragnets, you know, and they pull in people and they sort of, you know, filter them, you know, with torture, you know, to find out as much information as they can. And they find, you know, develop, you know, as many, you know, uh, agents uh, informing on their Palestinian neighbors as possible. That's how they find, you know, where the uh, Hamas, uh, you know, uh, leaders and members, you know, have their families and then they target them with a bomb. And they all do it, you know, with an AI program as well. So he continues on. I was just their sandbag Palestinian, one of the hundreds. Yes, now, you know, there's about 10,000 Palestinian prisoners. And, uh, you know, about 4,800 that were arrested since October the 7th, even. And... Uh, 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 oh, let's see where he is quoted again. I, f I feel isolated as a Palestinian in this country, yes, because it's not supposed to exist. Yeah. He has faith that one day he'll be able to return home and live the rest of his life in a free Palestine. Well, there you go. I mean, after reading after reading that touching uh, narrative, right there, it reminds me of this. It, it makes me think about it. This, this there was a there was a part. There was a time period within the anti-apartheid struggle where similar articles were were being written by by exiles who escaped the apartheid in South Africa or the oppression in Mozambique or Angola or Zimbabwe. And they're able to return to that to a country at least free of the direct colonial rule. So I I appreciate the statement that he wanted the the, the, the hope that he has to return to a free Palestine. That mm -hmm. that that has a similar Similar sentiments have been have been spoken by other um other my other immigrants to to the third to the uh, imperialist countries who escaped um similar abuses and violations of their human rights by the oppressive governments there. Mm -hmm. In this yeah. in this situation, though, the Canadian and the United States are aiding in the oppression of the people. Represented by Ahmed, so we have a we have a we have a more challenging situation here. Mm. And we'll, have to, we'll have to just see. We we need to work towards that free Palestine. We can't mm. just see what happens. We have to work towards 
their free Palestine and support him and others who are struggling around the world for that free Palestine. It's possible. It's possible in, you know, in the next uh, five, five years, you know, that we could break down the whole Zionist system. But it depends on what the reaction is going to be of the uh, Islamic Ummah, of the uh, Arab League, which has done nothing. And uh, then on the, the, that leaves direct action, you know, and I know that there's a proposal, you know, to mobilize people to go to the Rafah crossing, 100,000 people to go to the Rafah crossing and open it up and uh, and, and move the uh, Zionists uh, who are squatting in front of the trucks and stopping them from moving into Gaza. And they've even set up tents now. They intend to stay there permanently, it seems, until everybody's gone. Well, they have to go. You know, we have to move in there, you know. If if the Egyptian police won't arrest them and hold them for uh, entry into Egypt without a visa, you know, that means 30 days in jail, like in the United States. Like if I went to the United States, I'd be I could be put into jail for 30 days because I'm I'm not allowed into the United States. And and if I step in there, I'm on American territory at a crossing, you know, and they can just keep me there. In fact, you know, that happened to me one time, you know, by accident at the New York airport. And I was kept for six hours and then deported. But uh, they could arrest them. You know, Egypt police, you know, just move in there, you know, and arrest them. You know, and if, you know, Egyptian police, you know, are not going to be allowed to arrest them, you know, because of the, you know, military, you know, occupation from the Zionists, well, then, you know, the Israel police should move in there and arrest them. You know, they're in violation of uh, <clears throat> international law. So they don't. So, you know, it has to be up to somebody else. And when I'm in contact, you know, with the Palestinians and Gaza, I say, you know, you know, how come you just don't go and occupy the whole rough crossing? You know, there's enough Palestinians to just take it over, you know, just without arms, you know, just by force of numbers. Just take it over, you know, move those, uh, you know, set the squatters, you know, out of the way and bring and get the food, you know, <laughs> bring it in yourself. That's what they should be doing. I don't know. They're not, you know, what are they waiting for? You know, the international intervention or something? Can you can you go in more detail so so our viewers and listeners can get get the background story about this? Yeah, uh, the international aid that was ordered by the Security Council of the United Nations is, you know, sitting there in trucks all lined up, you know, hundreds of trucks, all in a row on the highway leading to the Rafah crossing, about to go into Gaza. And then these Zionists, you know, came there and started waving flags in front of the trucks and wouldn't allow the trucks, you know, to advance anymore. And nobody came, you know, to move those squatters out of the way. So they're blocking the aid, you know. Last time I heard, since six days, they were blocking the aid. I think it's still going on because I saw another photo today, you know, of them setting up tents on the highway, blocking the trucks from going into Gaza. And famine has started already. So here we have a situation if 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 I understand it correctly, where settler, racist, Zionist, anti-Palestinian militants are blocking aid, and they are on Israeli territory, yeah. and Israeli government is doing nothing to move them. That's right. Yeah, aid there is another crossing from the north of Gaza from aid Israel aid. into Gaza, and there's some you know minimal aid going through there, but that's completely under Zionist control there. And the international aid is coming, you know, from Egypt. It's not coming from, from inside, you know. Like so, this is very serious. Yeah, yeah. So there's, you know, talk of mobilizing, you know, direct action uh, uh, people to uh, to go down there, you know. But you know what they're planning for, you know, like is, um, I think, you know, the maximum sort of such mobilization. When they're saying that, you know, if after the uh, International Court of Justice, you know, here's the report from Israel in a few days, because, you know, they were given 30 days, you know, to comply with the directives from the decision to stop, you know, genocidal actions. So, you know, if they don't comply, which they haven't, you know, then the court's going to order that uh, something, to, you know, to happen, you know, which is going to go to the Security Council and General Assembly. So... So, I mean, you know, if people, you know, went down there, activists went down there, you know, in direct action, they'd have international law on their side. And they should be protected. They should be protected by the Egyptian police, by the Egyptian military. That's what I figure. 
you know, if they're not willing to take the initiative themselves, at least they can protect the people who are. But I think it should be done much sooner than that. Much sooner, you know, than uh, what was being proposed initially, you know, like it's 20 days after the International Court of Justice, you know, uh, decision. So uh, that has to be sort of, you know, discussed uh, further. So we'll see, you know, what what's going to be developed there, you know, but that's what's under discussion right now. So what 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 measures are the are is the Palestinian movement taking at this time about about that situation? No, they're under fire, you know, like in Janine, you know, they're you know, something that's happening in Gaza is happening inside Janine. You know, they're being occupied, you know, practically permanently by the military. And all the activists and you know, anybody with a gun, you know, is being killed. So and what, uh, and they're arresting people who you know uh, are you know who they get some sort of an idea you know like our supporters. So you know, and they're cleaning up. You know, this has happened you know periodically. You know, there's always you know these waves of the intifadas. You know, and then they come in you know kill a thousand Palestinians, arrest you know another couple of thousand, and then it quiets down you know for another ten years. It's a generational sort of phenomenon. Even if this time you know it's better armed and better organized. But it's still, you know, like a totally, you know, outmaneuvered still. Well, I, I guess what I what I meant was, the situation at the border, at the border, the Rafa crossing you're describing, and the yeah. settlers blocking the trucks. Okay. Yeah. It seems to me, and maybe I'm wrong about this, but at least on this side of the Atlantic Ocean. That isn't known too well. Yeah. There's a rally today, Labor for Palestine. And I'm going to attend the rally. And I'm going to mention, I'm going to somehow bring, I'm going to bring this up. Maybe I need you to. You should speak. Up. Yeah, sure. You should be I speaking. Can fly, I know I can create a quick flyer about this. And on this, on this one topic, because I don't think it's known. Mm. Because it, it was not, in, and that there needs to be some co coordinated action on this side of the Atlantic to support the right of the Palestinian people to get this aid. Mm. Or just to highlight that it's not being received because the Israeli government is not moving at, at this point. Let's just say the Israeli government is not moving. Their protesters out of the way. Yeah. The Israeli police is on Israeli territory. They've been told by the International Court of Justice to stop to allow materials into, into Israel, into Gaza, so the Gazan people can be freed of the, of the deprivation of water, food, etc. Yeah. By not moving them out the way, the, the protesters out the way, they are they are continuing their acts that were cited in the lawsuit by South Africa. So I think this is something that, it, that since it's occurring, should be known. Mm -hmm. This is a, that's all, and well, that you should yeah. ask to speak about this, you know, because this has to be sort of announced as quickly as possible, and uh, to as many media uh, as possible who are present. And, okay, uh, but now supposedly, uh, supposedly, I'm not going to mention names of groups, but I was told that you, unless someone wants you, unless some group has a at this point, it may be quote too late to speak, but I'm going to see what, what I can do. Mm -hmm. This is occurring. We need something printed. Uh, let me see if I can find the photo of the tents that yeah, came up today. We, we need some propaganda. We need yeah. some proof. Yeah. Because as far as I know, maybe I'm wrong. This is not known. Yeah. Well... Yeah, it's not very well known here either, you know. It's just uh, on the internet. Hmm. I don't think I'm going to be able to find it so easily. Okay, I'll, I'll put a link uh, I'll put a link to it, you know, in the comments afterwards. And I'll yeah. put a link to uh, Ahmed's article as well. Well, I could simply create a, a leaflet, even just a leaflet that this is there there are there are, there are verified reports this is occurring. The photo, just a photo, you know, with a caption, you know, like a, that that itself, you know, like, you know, is yeah. the proof right there and then, you know, like, I think I, there's, I have two, oh, yes, yes, I know where they are now. 
Uh huh. Okay, I'll I'll look for them. You know, uh, while you uh, continue here. Yeah, and, so because uh, because um so any so we have this have that situation where now with this the quote unquote, the quote unquote border crisis in the United States, which is a which is a political it is a political emergency. See, I'm gonna say something about this. People don't want to hear this. There is yes. no border crisis. No, there isn't. There is no border crisis. No, there's not. Some politicians want to get some money for something, so they create a crisis. Once they get the money, the crisis goes away. That's how U.S. politics works. Everybody runs to the border. Oh, it's a border crisis. No, there's not. They basically are saying, we want more money for Israel. We want more, we, we want money to build a wall between U.S. And, and Mexico, the Republicans. We have, quote, created a crisis, quote. Ukraine is not getting as much money no more. Sorry, Ukraine. Time is up for you, buddy. Mm -hmm. We're propping you up no more. We got to help our bad boys in Israel. Mm -hmm. So they have a border crisis. I want everybody to, to, to read this more carefully in the U.S. press. Where is the crisis? There isn't one. They make the crisis up to get money for Israel and for a wall. We've got to stop being so stupid to believe the prep, the propaganda of the U.S. press. It's election year. They're going to make up stuff with election year to get what they want, the Republicans. And that's what's going on. And that's why Israel's going to get more money because of the border crisis. It's nothing but a sham. It's a scam. Okay? I mean, United States is an empire. It's not a country. So the, so the people who say it's a border crisis act like, act like it's a country. It's an empire. They let in who they want to let in. If they want you coming in, you ain't coming in. And that's it. I'm sorry. It's just the way, it's the way empires run it. A country, a country will run it differently. You know? So they have the, the border crisis to get more money for Israel. That's what is a way of getting money to Israel. They're very sneaky. They're very slick. They're very shrewd. And those who follow the media and want to jump on the, on the border crisis are not being sophisticated and shrewd and smart. They want money for Israel. That's how they're getting it with the border crisis. Yeah. You got to figure that one out. They want money for a wall. They want money for Israel. Maybe some money for Ukraine. So how, how are they going to get it? Create a border crisis. Tie everything to the border crisis. Put this in the bill. Here, Israel. Here, Here's a few more billion. Ukraine, we give, we give you a couple of things, man, but y'all got to give it up, you know. I don't know. I just I just want to talk about that. And now we're learning that the aid that the, that the ICJ has ordered Israel to let in is not being let in. This is incredible. I've got it. Here, I'll show you. <clears throat> incredible. There are the trucks. <sighs> okay, so this is uh, included in this video. The video is going to be up on YouTube. So in this <clears throat> video on YouTube can be shown at any time. Permanently. Here's the proof. This jerk here, look at them. Really? And then these young people, you know, indoctrinated since, you know, 21 years. Probably just uh, are on leave from the military. They are, they are saying, we will not let the Palestinians live. We will yeah. make sure that they that they are, by making this media stunt, and by the Israeli police not arresting them, or even, well, I'm not going to say it. But by not arresting them or detaining detaining them from so this is this is complicit this is complicity of the of the Israeli government over over, over that blockade. Yes, it is. It's complicity. Yeah. And uh, here, this is an aid truck that did get in. And it was traveling to North Gaza, and it was targeted and hit by a missile or a tank shell. Here's all the aid just falling out of the truck. 
that needs to get on it on on the international media that that and that needs to get to to the ICJ office. Yeah. That's, that's, well, that's the example. That's the example right there. Over there, shut the case. Over there, shut the case. A, I did a documentary study on what happened uh, before that was a, a precedent here in the Sabra Shatila massacre, which was uh, very well known at the time and remembered for a long time. And I don't know, <clears throat> it's starting to be forgotten, you know. But in 1982, when Israel invaded Lebanon <clears throat> and the refugee camps of the Palestinians who were civilians, unarmed, etc., um, were uh, left uh, to the mercy of the uh, local fascist gangs, the Israel, the Zionist occupation of uh, Beirut in Lebanon, and uh, uh, the assurances of the United States, you know, for the for their <clears throat> guardianship, you know, over the refugees, you know, after the Palestinian PLO fighters left for Tunisia, was not kept, and three thousand Palestinians were killed in three days. I wrote a documentary study called Sabr Shatila, which is now the official reference and i submitted it you know to the international court of international criminal court one time as an evidence and i wrote it you know as a uh, as a legal sort of you know affidavit of uh, proof as to who is responsible and i analyzed the role of general sharon in detail and the map from the new york times and everything <clears throat> but i should send it to the international court of justice as well as part of a documentary evidence of the geno genocidal precedent, you know, practiced by Israel in conjunction with the phalangist, you know, militia in Lebanon. But I think we're going to be cut off pretty soon by Zoom. But uh, that's, you know, something that I wanted to include there. Thank and you. Uh, if uh, you would like to conclude, you know, please, you're very welcome to do so because I can't think of, you know, like how how this can go on. It's just uh, unbelievable. Well, we want we want to make sure that all of our viewers and listeners get out there in the streets, get in your organizations, continue to fight, support the Palestinian resistance, and the right of Palestinian people to not be to not be oppressed, to be free, to have their own land, to have their own culture, to have their own nation, to have their own communities. Hmm. The Israeli and government, the United States government, has no right to seize Syrian land, anybody's land, for any reason. Hmm. It's all hmm. needs to stop. And this program so, is dedicated to making this to making this happen and make, and help help make make you aware. So please share this video. Please yes. like this. Video. Let, let people know we're doing this. Because That's what I wanted to say. Yeah, great. Right. You know, Comrade Nut. You know, he's uh, been sharing this video on his uh, compilation videos, documentary videos that he's making that are <clears throat> excuse me that are up at the uh, video channel of the Bundes Movement as well as uh, my own uh, Abraham Weisfeld uh, channel here. Okay, so uh, bye again. I'll see you next week for sure. Right.